Welcome to the Leadership Lyceum, a CEO's virtual mentor. Now, here's your host, Tom Lindquist. Glad to have you back in the Leadership Lyceum, where we bring you direct access to top CEOs and directors of boards in an interview format that provides insight on situational issues that confront CEOs every day. It is a CEO's virtual mentor. Welcome to Episode 26, Season 7 of a CEO's Virtual Mentor. I'm joined in the program by four of five women who on May 1st, 2019, published together a collective autobiographical book titled The Energy Within Us. It is their stories across the arc of their lives from childhood environments and experiences that shape them to and through their long careers and executive leadership roles in the energy industry. These women have a great deal in common. They're all dear friends, They are all accomplished executive leaders in the energy industry in their careers. They're all giving back by serving broader leadership roles in corporate and non-for-profit boardrooms and social service organizations. They all have unbounded generosity of spirit, and they all, as you will hear, exude the energy within themselves. Our conversation, while sharing a couple glasses of wine in celebration of the publishing of their book, was so enjoyable, rich, and wide-ranging, and the company so warm that we recorded slightly over three hours. What to leave on the cutting room floor to bring this down to a digestible podcast was my biggest challenge. Let's meet our guests right after expressing our special thanks to the clients of Lyceum Leadership Consulting that have enabled us to bring you this podcast, and to you, ladies and gentlemen, our devoted listenership for your continued encouragement and programming suggestions. And let me mention that we cannot improve without your feedback and suggestions. Please take a moment and follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or on your favorite podcast platform, and rate us with your feedback. Let's meet our guests, the authors of The Energy Within Us, Talisa Tolliver, Carolyn Green, Joyce Hayes-Giles, and Hilda Pinnix ragland The authors had spoken as a panel earlier that day at the annual meeting of the American Association for Blacks and Energy, or ABE, A-A-B-E. We'll join our conversation right after this. Congratulations to you all. I think the book was published officially on May 1st. Yes. 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 And it's out in hardcover. And this morning you did a panel discussion with the group about the book. And when I showed up uh, a little later this afternoon, you were busy book signing and sold, all. I think, all the books that you had brought. Or almost all of them. Almost exactly. all of them. Just 16. Yes. I just got a note from the two sisters. They said they're sending 16 up to the, the okay. suite here. Oh, great. great. That's it. And we'll do that. We'll sell that tomorrow. Probably. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> That's excellent. Well, these are very personal stories. And, and in the stories, you give a lot of yourselves. And the interesting thing is the variety of experiences. And maybe the common denominator in all is the success that you all have had in career. And I'm excited today to talk in more depth about your stories and to share these. And I I wanted to start with why did you write the stories? And Joyce, maybe I can start with you. And Hilda, I'll come around to you in the end on this because I think you were the glue that brought everybody together around writing them. But Joyce, can you tell us why you wrote your story? Well, first because Hilda asked us to participate (laughs) as co-authors, so that was first and foremost. But I was pleased to do it because I will tell you that my daughters have asked me many times to write a book. And so when they found out that I was writing it, they were very pleased. And they read the draft and gave me feedback saying, Mom, we didn't know this about you. Oh. We didn't know what you went through. Because to your point earlier, when we talk about protecting our kids from a lot of things, the time is different. The era that I grew up in is very different. But they had no idea of the challenges that I went through in life. So that's the second thing. The third thing is once 
has started writing, I think you'll find that all of us do a lot of mentoring. And when you mentor, they ask you a lot of questions about how you got to where you are, what happened along the way, how did you make certain decisions. And so I found in writing, this is going to be instructional you know, for some of the other people that we mentor. Mm -hmm. So that was part of the inspiration. Your daughters didn't know the story, the depth of the story before. Then why were they interested in you telling your story? What did they know and why were they asking? Well, one of the things they knew, which is why they told me they didn't want to follow me in the corporate world, is that I worked very, very hard. And they did not have a real appreciation for all of what went into the success that I had in my career. So I think that was part of the fascination with them, just to learn more about what it's like in the world that I lived in that's very different from the world they have chosen. One, that I helped mold for them, and two, the careers that they've chosen. They didn't want to go anywhere near the corporation, they did not want to be attorneys. Their dad is an attorney, my ex-husband, mm -hmm. and a judge now. They just didn't want that. And so they both are very creative and chose to go into a career that was more in the entertainment area. Mm -hmm. For whatever reason, I found that a lot of kids coming up during that time were choosing to try that at least. Carolyn, why did you write the book? Because Hilda pushed, <laughs> pushed me into it. Once I got into it, it was a useful exercise in looking back and summarizing where I had been and then kind of thinking about why I did one thing as opposed to another, even if I didn't put it into words, at least I went through that sort of mental exercise. My husband also has been telling me I should write down my, my story. So at least in part, this is a response to, to his encouragement or badgering me, whichever. <laughs> sometimes I felt it was badgering, sometimes I felt it was encouragement. And then the, the last reason is that we have two kind of adopted sons there, they're godsons, and they have daughters. Both of them have, have daughters. One has two daughters, the other has one. And I realized it's important for them to know my story as one of the only grandmothers they know. We may not be related by blood, but certainly by love ties we are. And so they want to know about what grandma does and how she got there. I see. Talisa? So I've been watching these four women from afar and always admired them. And so to me, the book was more about a celebration. And it was a, I remember when we all sat down and we talked about it and we said, hey, you know, I think it was a celebration. I think it was a, the anniversary for, for Abe at the time. Abe is A-A-B-E the American Association for Blacks in Energy. And we were all sitting around and we said, you know what, we've got some incredible talent sitting here and talking and we should share that. And so for me, it was more about an opportunity to celebrate who we are and what we've done. And Hilda always has to kind of confirm where, where I am because I'm not one that really likes to tell my story. I'm okay just saying, look, I'm going to do what I do, and I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. And I've had people tell me, you need to tell your story. And so I think, for me, it was an opportunity to celebrate. That's the way I think about it, is the really, really hard work, but also just an admiration for the other folks in this room today. And so for me, that's really what it was about, and I'm honoring them and honoring us and what we've accomplished, because it is not, it's not easy. And I think we make it look easy. And as today I said, you know, leadership is not for the faint of heart. And so for me, it was just a celebration. Mm -hmm. It certainly was an opportunity to 
be involved in an activity with some people that you really respect, but you also really like. This is Carolyn Green once again. Had it been a different group of people, I may or may not have done it. But with this group, yes, I will take that journey, even though it's uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And it was truly an eye-opener. This is Joyce Hayes-Giles. Just as my daughters indicated, they didn't know all of what I've gone through. I've known these ladies, Mm -hmm. and there was stuff that they had in their chapters that I didn't know about them, and it gave me an even greater appreciation. It's interesting. I mean, some of these (laughs) stories would never come up in a normal conversation. They would not. No. This is Carolyn Green. One of the motivations for me was I knew that we all had rather different paths, and I thought it was important that other people understand that Black women are not a monolith. We all have different backgrounds. We all have different approaches. We all had different journeys. And we're just as different as anyone else. So it was important for people to see those different stories and get that message, at least for me. Mm -hmm. Did you see all this, Hilda? Did you see the diversity of these stories that would come I, out? Or what I was most the certainly purpose? did, and it wasn't by chance that each person, that I spoke with each person. I knew some of their stories. So I wanted a book that told the different stories. We've gone through different steps along our path. What did you discover? What surprised you after? I feel closer to everyone in this room than I did when we started. I felt close then, but I have a strong sense of appreciation and value for you as a person. Yes, we all had successful energy careers, but there is another deep sense, that strong sense of knowing who we are and how we can help each other. Without struggle, there's no strength. This is Talisa Tolliver. I've had such admiration and respect just knowing on the surface where these women were in their careers. But then whenever you read what they went through to get there, you realize they're even more amazing than you thought, right? Mm -hmm. Because none of us have gotten where we are without struggle. And that's why I use the quote, you know, without struggle, there's no strength. We actually lived many of our phases of our career. Absolutely. Together. 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 Mm -hmm. Together. Whether we were moving from one job to the other, whether there was a reorganization, a merger, an acquisition, we went through it together. And even on a personal level, when some of us, like with my divorce, um, able to have someone that I could talk to and share, because I'm a pretty private person, Mm -hmm. In addition to the support around the career and your work life, we connected on a personal level, so we were like sisters, where we were a support to each other, and if we needed someone, then you're there. So for me, it's whether we're talking about the accomplishments of of our family members and what they went through and the legacy of those family members, but also understanding from a professional standpoint that we have to stand on the grounds that were set for us by others. And if you don't understand that, and if you don't try to learn from those who have been there, that's what this whole thing is really about, right? And so when I'm frustrated and probably about to do something I probably shouldn't do, (laughs) I will call Hilda and say, look, this is where I am and I'm not happy about this. So, you know, talk me through it, let me walk through it. And she'll tell me to calm down. And then we walk through it and we we talk about what's your plan? What do you want to do? How do you want to deal with this situation? And I think all of us have been in that position at some point in time. So, And it's important because none of us had necessarily those corporate role models to follow, it's important for us to provide those roadmaps for the generations who are following us Mm -hmm. so that they're not as lost 
as, as we may have felt. Let's take a break, and when we come back for part two, let's look at the roadmap, as Carolyn mentions. We'll be right back. back for part two, we delve into the foundational experiences of the authors. Let's go into the roadmap. Let's start with upbringing. Joyce, I'll start with you, and this actually comes from your acknowledgments, and each of your acknowledgments at the front of the book gives a little glimpse of what's to come, certainly in the stories, but it gives a little insight into your own personalities and you. You talk about the courage to act, the character to do the right thing, to do anything in spite of adversity and live with purpose. And you had a mantra that I imagine you still say today, and you're teaching others that I'm better than that. I grew up in a segregated environment in Mississippi, and I told my age today by saying what year I was born. But I that didn't hear it. that. that that's, that'll be out of, on the editing room floor. But, but that era, there was a lot of discrimination and nasty things said and done to people of color. And so if you would get those messages and you believe them, you would really not do anything because you think that you're not capable or there's nothing good that's going to come to you. I mean, you were born into poverty. You were born as someone who was viewed as lesser in society. So when you have strong parents, for example, I'll start there, who would tell us, you are going to go to college. Education is your way out and they would instill in us things that we had to do, work hard, study. They put education ahead of everything, so we didn't have a lot of, other than church, not a lot of social outlets, and we were expected to do schoolwork, read, all of that kind of stuff. It's largely your parents' action and the disciplinary path. What does that look like? Tell us how that feels. Well, I will give you a very personal example of how important it was. My dad, as you'll see in the book, did not finish college. He was in the Army and he was able to get his, I guess it's the equivalent of a GED, but he expected that of us. My mother was college educated. Her father would not let my dad marry her unless he committed to, and I said that in the book, unless he committed to making sure that she finished college. It was very, very important. So on a personal level, my oldest sister was what we called a bookworm, and she excelled at everything because all she did was study. Her head was down in a book and all of that. And my dad expected all of us to do what she did. So she would bring all A's home. And with me, I mean, and she graduated valedictorian of her class. I was second in my class, salutatorian. But the impactful thing that happened to me, when I was not bringing all A's, I had A's and B's, my dad always said it wasn't good enough. So I always thought that I was not living up to the expectation he had. The year that I got all A's to bring home was the year my dad died. Mm -hmm. So he never Mm -hmm. saw Uh that. And so on a personal level, I mean, those are things that stay with me Mm -hmm. even today because I felt that my dad never got a chance to see. But those are the things that were important. Education, education, education. And we were driven hard Mm -hmm. down that path. Mm -hmm. The agreement 
with the grandparents was that your dad made sure your mom finished school. It's, absolutely. He took that very seriously right down to the children's level. Abs absolutely. <laughs> he, was, he was real hard-nosed about it. Why? Well, I mean, he, it, he wanted more for us. Uh -huh. And truthfully, the belief was the only way you get out is through education. My parents didn't know how we were going to go to college. Financially, they couldn't afford to do it, but they always told us we knew we were going to go to college. And so the expectation for us was to perform, do well in school, and the scholarships will come. And so that was how we were able to go to college, because we were able to get scholarships. And Joyce, who is your role model beyond? I mean, you can only see so far out. You knew that you had to go to college. Could you get a sense of what was beyond college that would motivate you? Well, there were role models, and I'll give you some examples of that. But I will tell you, seeing beyond that, just on a personal level, besides your parents pushing you, we knew that we had to get the education came first, college, and then we'd get a job and make some money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that was kind of how I was seeing it at that time. But aside from that, in our church, a lot of the people who belong to our church were our teachers, our principals. I mentioned Mr. Rigsby in that mm -hmm. book. He was my biology teacher, and he used to always encourage us and encourage me because he saw things in me that perhaps others did not see or maybe I didn't see in myself. But he was very educated, and so I had those kind of role models. Megar Evers was an educator, but there were a lot of role models like that in our church and the black community. I'll do my best to provide a sense of this great American Medgar Evers and the climate of the times and the powerful, uplifting influence of mentors and teachers in Joyce's Mississippi. Medgar Wiley Evers was born in 1925 and raised in Decatur, Mississippi. He encountered frequent, if not daily, overt racism through his childhood. After his sophomore year in high school, Medgar followed his brother, Charles, into the Army during World War II. He was assigned to a segregated field battalion in England and France. And in 1946, after three years of distinguished military service, Evers received an honorable discharge, finished high school, and enrolled at Alcorn College in Mississippi, now Alcorn State University, where he majored in and received a Bachelor of Arts in Business Administration. It was there that he met Merle Beasley. They married on Christmas Eve, 1951. Medgar Evers found that not much had changed in his home state after returning from the war in his country's service. He had a sense of responsibility and dedication to his home and determined to help and get active. He joined the NAACP and then applied for admission to the University of Mississippi Law School, but his application was denied. This action brought Evers to the attention of NAACP national leadership, and he was appointed Mississippi's first field secretary for the organization that same year. Moving to Jackson, Mississippi in 1954, Evers worked to set up an NAACP office there. In the early 1960s, he organized high-profile boycotts of merchants in Jackson. My own takeaway from Medgar Evers is that he had the ability to inspire hearts and minds, and the courage to shine sunlight on the duties and responsibilities of people on all sides of a needed change and hold them accountable. Here's an example. Now, for many of us who've gone overseas, fought for this country, fought for Mississippi, we fought for Alabama, we fought for North Carolina, we fought for Illinois, and we fought for every state in this union. Now, we're gonna stay here and see that the things that the mayor has said become a reality. Seriously, he died because he was a threat to the changes in the black community. He was the field secretary for the NAACP, and he would come to us at church and share with us things that were going on and what they were doing to try to change things. 
and somebody shot him in his driveway. He's going home. His wife, Merle, and their children were in the house. Mm -hmm. And the visual I had is they shot him down and he laid down in his driveway bleeding to death. We saw mm -hmm. that on, on television. On television. Right. But not only just seeing it on television, but knowing this man was a member of our church. He was a real person. He wasn't just to some people, he represented civil rights changes. He fought for civil rights. For me and my family and our church members, he was part of our family. That's what was just really shocking when I read it because so much is so far removed from our daily comprehension or interaction. Well, having grown up in that era, for example, I still see very clearly, very vividly, the signs for segregation, whites, colored. And my mother, we were out, and I just wanted to get a drink of water, so I'm heading over to get water, and it had whites at this fountain, and she snatched me away. I couldn't figure out why was she doing this. I'm just getting some water. Well, she could have been hurt. I could have been hurt because at that time you just didn't do that. And that was a lesson I learned early on that you have. You are in your lane here. You can't drink here. We couldn't go to the doctor any day of the week for people of color. Your designated day was Wednesday and that was when other people weren't going into the doctor's office. He was definitely an influence, and his death was one of the things that really drove me to start looking very hard at how we change the world, how we change the culture. Those are things that stayed with me so that what has given me the real need to do change and to be a part of the community and to help people came from my experiences like that growing up mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the oppression and all that we went through in segregated Mississippi. If you want another example of that same spirit, here's a clip of a TEDx Ben talk given by Merle Evers Williams, Medgar's widow. She's accomplished in her own right. In 1995, Mrs. Evers Williams became both the first female and first full time chairman of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, or NAACP, a post she held until 1998. Here she is. As I thought about our remarks for this afternoon, I asked myself what can I say that people don't already know? I have been so blessed. From the very beginning of my being to be born into a family of people who always said, rise above the norm. Always achieve the highest goal that you can reach. And yes, as a child, you don't want to hear all of those things and you kind of pass it aside. But there was a grandmother who played a very important role in my life. And she said to me time and time again, baby, you are here for a purpose. Don't forget that purpose. And as a child, I had no idea what she was talking about. But I later came to understand and actually to appreciate what she said. Born into a family of activists, but activists who were community activists within their own community, who believed that you did not step out of those boundaries. You did not rock the boat. You did not challenge anything. And we all know that in today's society, and even before and in the future, you have to challenge those things that you feel are worth challenging. I have had many interesting things happen in my life and they have all been because of changes, of not being afraid to make them. Corporate America, where women were very few at the time when I moved in. And then there was politics, where very few women could participate then, certainly not as candidates. And being rebuffed 
at every turn because not that you were not capable, but because you were a woman and there was no place for women. And then you move on to other things and you find, by golly, I can do this. And every time someone said, you can't, that was a determination to prove them wrong because you knew that you could and you also knew that you would be helping to open doors for other people to follow. I was told when I ran for chairman of the NAACP and told by men, we will never allow that to happen because a woman should not be at the helm of organizations such as that. And after all, you are only the widow of, and you can't do this. And I said, but you don't know me, do you? Move, because I'm coming through. As a result, as a result of that attitude, as a result of bringing other women in who were no longer afraid, I ended up in that position, and it's one of the toughest I have ever had. And don't tell me, people, as we approach the whole political arena now, that voting doesn't count. I won by one vote. <laughs> one vote that helped to change everything around and help to put people, women, qualified in positions that they never would have been in. Let's take a break. We'll be right back after this with Hilda Penix Raglan. We're back with Hilda Penix Ragland, who hails from a farming community in North Carolina. The agricultural environment presents many, many things that need attention, and Hilda had the curiosity and the industriousness to want to attend to them. I'm a fifth generation landowner, mm -hmm. and actually fifth generation landowner on both sides of my family. And we had a core value of education. And the core value was part of what I mentioned in the book, my grandmother, who I affectionately called Mama. She owned businesses. She was the community doctor. She was an organist who wrote music. So that was that core education and core family was a part of who we are. And as we talk about education, that was a given. The question was, where would I go to school? And that's when I made the decision to go to North Carolina A&T versus going to a uh, PWI school. I did grow up in the time when we were the first to integrate schools. Mm -hmm. So most of my life was in the integrated schools. This was in Orange County. North Carolina, and it was the first area, it's near Chapel Hill and Hillsboro, the first area to actually launch integration. So I grew up with a grandfather in the church. He was the minister. He was my grandfather, so we went with him. We did not stay all day. We didn't have all the activities at church. My father believed in education outside, and so some of those would be going out to collect leaves. <laughs> I know most trees by name, by bark, by leaves. We went to lots of museums and zoos and all of that. But he said there's a lesson in everything. There's a lesson from everyone. But the biggest thing was giving back. My grandmother and grandparents gave back. And I mentioned in the book even that my father would take us to the orphanage and every year for the Christmas, we had to give something to someone who did not have. And so it's a part of who I am. I was taught you always pay it forward. Too much is given, much is expected. And you don't give and help for something in return. You never worry about that. The reason we're here is to reach out and help other people and make the life, the world we lead a better place. Mm -hmm. And so that's just who I am. 
fortunately, I do have three of my dad's brothers married, three of my mom's sisters. And so I always had family, family, family. It seemed a lot of mentors, people that would give you advice, instruction, discipline. What do you think it is about you or was about you as a young girl that inspired people to want to provide that sort of advice and there's always an affinity there's got to be a two-way affinity why why were I think it was because attracted? I was always trying to figure something out I would examine the back of the old TV sets take them apart and make jewelry I was always <laughs> examining and breaking something to try to rebuild it I grew up on a beef cattle farm so I could herd cows and we raised all of our food, most of which was organic. My father actually could grow any kind of vegetable from eggplants to asparagus to white garlic. potatoes and garlic and mm. herbs. Did that impress you? It did, and it's why I still do some of that today. <laughs> Even when I was in Connecticut, staying with my dad's brother and mom's sister, they believed in smoothies before they were named smoothies. <laughs> so I was somewhat of that organic <laughs> child who continued to probe and ask, and one who always wants to reach out to help others. Mm -hmm. uh, so seeing people excel, whether it's a mentee or just someone I'm meeting, it motivates me to do more. Mm -hmm. Talisa, you grew up, if I recall, first it was predominantly a white community mm -hmm. in Oklahoma, I yes. think. And then you moved. And it was sort of a shock when you moved and others were shocked by you. You wrote about how y your voice was, uh, you spoke like a white person, I think. And it seemed like that was an uncomfortable part. But talk about your upbringing, I guess, more generally. So I, it's interesting, my, I talked about it today on the panel, so my, my mother was one of 16 children. And wow. my grandparents were not educated, but they were incredibly smart. And they also, as Joyce mentioned, talked about education. And that was the way out, and that was the way to remove the stigma of poverty and, and also discrimination to a certain point. And so, Sorry, can I pause you there? What do you mean by that? That education is a way to remove discrimination at a certain point? Because we live in a capitalistic society. And at the end of the day, to be able to say, I have a certain amount of wealth, and wealth is relative, certainly at that time, but I can buy a house, I can take care of my kids. That was something to be proud of. Mm -hmm. And I remember as a, as a very small child, my grandfather said, we were sitting in a, in a cafeteria and he said to me, he said, do you see that, that guy over there? And he said, that guy is working in a place where he doesn't have to work his entire life. He said, I'm not educated and so I'll be working my entire life. I'll work until the day that I die. And he said, I want you kids to go and get an education and he said they have these programs, and he didn't know what they were, but it's things like your 401k, it's things like your retirement. And he said, if you get in those programs, you don't have to work to the bone for the rest of your life. And so to understand that and how he had to grow up, but how with 16 children, almost all of them went to college. That's amazing. And so when you think about that, for me, and, and I said it today, that how could I not succeed or try to succeed? How dare I not be successful understanding what not only my grandparents went through, what my parents went through, even before them? That's how I kind of think about it. So my parents both were college professors at HBCUs, mm -hmm. and it was about education and learning. And so we went to the schools where they thought I could get the best education and learning. And those happened to be in communities that were predominantly white. Mm -hmm. And so when I talk about this small town in Oklahoma where 
a lot of people worked in oil and gas, but hardly any of them had college degrees. And when you think about being out in the field, working all the time, but not being able to really, there was a ceiling in how far you could go without a, a college education. So for me, it was just always about wanting to do better, wanting to make my parents proud, but then also growing up with people that were my friends that just happened to be white. Mm. And they were my close friends, and I grew up with them. And so going from that environment and growing up with the only black people in my town were my cousins and one of the family that we weren't really supposed to spend that much time with, to be honest with you, yeah. right? And so going from that environment, which was quite normal to me, where it was the majority white, and then going to an HBCU where it was all black, and not even realizing that I was going to be looked at differently mm-hmm. was eye-opening for me. And what I talk about in the book is being okay with who I was regardless. So if I'm who I am in a black community or if I'm who I am in a white community, I'm still who I am. Mm -hmm. And so I think that was the learning for me is just to be who you are and be okay with it and not be so moved by others' perception of you. Is there an example of you grappling with that? Yeah, so I talk in in the book about when I first started to think that I could be successful in this industry, but also feeling a bit of resentment from other black employees about how fast I was moving and what I was doing to move. Hear comments, and I talk about it in the book around, why are you doing all this? You're never gonna be successful. I wouldn't work that hard. Or you know how to talk to those people, but there was always these excuses around why I was succeeding. And I was actually hurt by that Mm -hmm. because I thought, so you're also assuming that I'm not making it because I'm working hard. (laughs) This issue of race in our country is pretty fluid, right? Mm -hmm. And I think people always think it's one way, but it can impact you regardless of what side of that that coin you're on. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's one of those things where I see some of my colleagues who were raised in a totally urban environment, a totally black environment, and they struggle with working in corporate America because they didn't grow up in that environment. So I understand that difficulty. And I think it's unfortunate that they feel like they can't be who they are and still succeed. Hmm. So it's just sort of interesting dynamic you have to work through. And my mother was an English literature professor. And so we could not use bad grammar at the tables, (laughs) you know? And so I had to apologize for being able to as we say, speak the king's English, right? Mm -hmm. So it's been a curious journey for me, which I think is sort of the opposite of what I think a lot of my black colleagues experienced because they were raised in a totally black environment and having to adjust to a primarily or maybe all white environment in corporate America. Mm -hmm. And so it's just a different Mm -hmm. sort of perspective, I guess. Let's take another break. We'll be right back with part three to go into those formative decisions that further defined and shaped their lives. What were those formative decisions and who helped you make those decisions? At least in my experience, if you look back at the great leaders that you were influenced by? I mean, really influenced by not watching on TV from afar, mm-hmm. the people that were close to you, whether it be a great teacher, a great professor, a great church leader, a great coach. These are so few and far between. And as you get older, you're not seeking your parents' advice so much anymore, and they're not keeping you on the rails, you're seeking others. And it's, I think, instructive to think about who those people would have been. and maybe how different they were from you, or maybe they weren't different at all. Are they different gender, different race, from a completely different community? Are they work colleagues? These are momentous sort of decisions that you might make. And I'm thinking career sort of direction and grappling, not necessarily personal. I would say it's been a mentor, a sponsor that I've leaned on throughout. My what does that career. mean, Hilda? What does mentor mean? Does um, that mean someone's been assigned to you? Well, 
he wasn't officially assigned to me that I knew of, mm -hmm. but he clearly evolved and we have what I would call a lifelong relationship. I call him a trusted friend. One whom I can just say, ah, I was thinking about this. What are your thoughts? I may not always agree with what he tells me, mm -hmm. but I'll listen. I see him as a friend, as a mentor, but sometimes I think I become his mentor. mentor. Yeah. Because we've grown together in the energy industry. And while all of our decisions were not perfect, we've learned from each one as we've gone through. So describe this person's qualities. Caring, clearly a people person who believes in people, and I'll say all people regardless of the background you come from. He's one that grew up in the countryside of Pennsylvania where he always talks about picking cucumbers <laughs> and how difficult it is to pick cucumbers. We have a lot of similarities, so it's a person that I can relate to, who likes a garden, who enjoys entertaining and baking and cooking as much as I do. But more importantly, he enjoys family and education, and he believes in the people that work for him. When you think back to how that relationship was developed, and the, the value of this and where I'm going is, wouldn't we all love to have a person like that? How do we get a person like that? What inspired you both together? I saying? think it happened. You can't make a relationship if there is no relationship there. No Has chemistry. to be some chemistry, something where you <clears throat> both feel valued and respected for each other, the trust is there. How did that get created? It, it is long ago from a simple interview. And you can connect, and you can intuitively know whether you connect. And you can know when people care or don't care about you. If they're consciously talking about themselves and not how they can make something better, the signs are you need to really be cautious mm -hmm. because the person is there for themselves and not for someone else. But you watch the actions of a person, and they would speak for them. Mm -hmm. Joyce? I mean, I, I did have a person, he's passed on now, but fairly early in my career, who was someone who did not work in the same company I worked in, but was a very successful person who worked in a corporate environment who I felt comfortable talking with about some decisions that needed to be made, he would really play the devil's advocate and make me think about certain things. I'd have to make my own decisions, but he would challenge me to think about some things. And this person was a friend. The way that I met this person was when I moved to Detroit, I worked on one of the campaigns for, at the time, the guy who was running for mayor and the person who was my mentor that I'm talking about became his deputy. I met him working on that campaign and he was well respected in the community, had a real high level position so I felt good just being challenged to think about decisions. He was very decisive. So how did I select him? I just kind of feel that he selected me. He saw something in me as I was beginning my career and as I struggled with making the right strategic decisions or presenting cases at work or dealing with issues that I was not totally comfortable with and didn't feel comfortable talking with other people in the company who might think that I didn't know what I was doing or needed guidance, so I, I didn't want to do that. That was just that protective way. So I had this person who was really, really great, and I would consider that person a mentor. Mm -hmm. I've had lots of, of mentors and advisors. Carolyn Green. Partially because I've had lots of different jobs in different companies and in the public sector, the private sector, etc., I have one friend who has almost been a constant 
from my first job in the environment and she has kind of been a mentor but we've mentored each other when she was trying to decide whether to take a role in the federal government we talked through that and I was amazed because she used me as one of her references how did you start the relationship how did you create the interaction as I understand it it's you're the junior person correct yes I was put on a team that she was leading she was a board member of the agency that I was working with and it's funny she at first wasn't certain about me because she said I was too intense I, I don't know why <laughs> <laughs> I read your book but she did eventually tell me that she found out that I, I had a pretty good sense of, of wickedness, so I, I wasn't all bad. But we established a relationship outside of work as well, through church uh -huh. and choir, uh -huh. and actually through my husband, who is an interior designer, who wound up doing all of her family's interior design, their remodeling of their kitchen, their whole home. So our lives have been interwoven for 40 years, but we both have had parallel careers. I've taken a slightly different path from hers, but the subject matter has been pretty constant. But I've also had people at different times of my life, interestingly, a lot of white men who, once they got over the fact that this was a young black woman, decided, oh, this could be my daughter because she grew up pretty much as I did or pretty much the way I raised my children. She has the sorts of interests that my children have or I'd like my children to have. And so people have taken me under their wing because they kind of saw me as the daughter they'd like or they could see their daughter in me, which has been really good for me my entire career. Hmm. What you said there is very interesting. You started that by saying a white person, and the white person saw, once they got over this, then they started to see you as their daughter. And that's really interesting, <laughs> once they got over it. And that maybe goes a little bit to my generalized question, what is misunderstood? So is there something there that people have to overcome an understanding to kind of embrace what was there all along? For me, what generally was misunderstood was that because I'm black, I must be different, mm -hmm. and I'm not. They would find out that I'm, I'm not necessarily, my experiences weren't necessarily different from their experiences. Like Talisa, I grew up in a basically white environment, so the things that I did growing up, the schools I went to, the activities I was in, were the same as the kids I grew up with. Mm -hmm. And so when I go into a corporate setting, people who may not have had an experience with an African American from Iowa found out that the commonalities were much more prevalent than the differences mm -hmm. may have been. I think that's one thing that's very misunderstood. That struck a chord when you said that. Decisions, I think, were later stage decisions. And those people that helped that special instrumental someone that really made a difference in your career, and Talisa, the special instrumental someone and the help or the boost that they gave you. Yeah, so for me, I think it kind of comes in two buckets, right? So there's the bucket of the people that I was in the trenches with that we had a project and we worked really, really hard on it and we were counting on each other. And over time, we developed that respect and credibility with each other. And so those were my peers that I could bounce things off of. I continue to do that today, right? So some of them have recently retired. Some of them are still with the company, but they're people that I've been in the trenches with. And so to me, that's sort of part of that one side of the people that when I'm about to make a big decision, I'll bounce some things off of. The other is those people who were much higher in the organization that, than I were, that saw something in me. I'm not even sure I saw it in myself, but they saw it in me and they plucked me out of where I was and said, look, I think you can do this totally out of my wheelhouse 
totally different than what I thought I was going to be doing and said, won't you come and do this? There's probably one or two of those that I continue to have a relationship with. And I think to Carolyn's point, not only do you begin to have that professional relationship, but then at a certain point you have a personal relationship with those people who begin to care about you as a person and think about you as someone other than just this person that works for them. And so I think about it in those two buckets of the people that I was in the trenches with that respect me and I respect them. We counted on each other. We can bounce things off of each other. And then just those people that just said, look, I see something in her. Earlier in my career, it was, I see something in her, but she's a little rough around the edges, right? <laughs> and so I can talk to her and tell her, hey, from a style standpoint, you need to be thinking about this, or you might want to think about how you approach this decision in a different way. And then as I moved up in the company, it was just more around, I think you've got more capacity. I think you can do other things. Those are the people that, and I'll tell you, it's a very short list. The mm -hmm. people that I would actually ask, hey, I've got this choice to make. What do you think about it? It's a very, very short list. That concludes part three and formative decisions. Let's take a break and come back with part four barriers to forming instrumental networks, and to development feedback. What may be preventing instrumental networks from forming, and what stands in the way of receiving key professional development feedback? Stay tuned. We're back with part four, barriers to forming instrumental networks and to development feedback. What stands in the way? Here's Joyce Hayes Giles. For me, it was so limited. I was not comfortable exposing the need for help. Mm -hmm. And when I say the need for help, if I'm at a point where I'm trying to make some decisions about something that's really critical. I wouldn't talk to anybody in the company. I didn't have anyone within the company that I felt really secure in going to saying that I need the help. And maybe I didn't need the help, it was just a different opinion mm -hmm. or someone to look at where I'm going with a certain thing and either say to me, think about this or I think you're right on, mm -hmm. you're spot on. So that individual I was talking to you about mm -hmm. was safe for me mm -hmm. because that person didn't work for the company and knew me, believed in me, and could challenge me without me feeling vulnerable. Someone once said around executive coaching, it was a, a board member, actually I'll, I'll name him Walter Massey, who mm -hmm. was the, at the time that he said this to us, he was the chairman of Bank of America. He was saying about coaching that all great athletes have coaches. And the athlete that has a coach is not diminished by having the coaching. They're enhanced by that. So he was making a statement in support of the idea of being coached. There's sometimes a reluctance, perhaps, to coach. And I'll say this, I'll be controversial, but as a man to coach a woman, if that's going to create an uncomfortable pressure, and I wondered what your experience was with being coached and what positive coaching looks like. Maybe we all know what negative coaching looks like. So what does positive coaching look like? Did you experience it? I started back with... This is Talisa. I started back with feeling like I always had something to prove. Coming into an organization and being aggressive about my work, being very deliberate about my work, and just always feeling like I had something to prove. Where does that root from? Does that root from just being It comes who from you being a, an African-American female okay. in an arena where people don't expect you to succeed or they think there's a cap on where you can go. They don't even expect you to be there. What do you mean, yeah. Carolyn? Be where? 
there be in that, that or, level. In, oh. in that organization that do, or doing that job. Yeah. Or at the table in a board seat. Yeah. Certainly. So the coaching for me was more around, you don't have to prove anything. We know what you bring to the table. And so now we need to work on you know, how you build relationships and how you want to show up in the room mm -hmm. and what you need to do to prepare and those sort of things. So that kind of teaching and influence helped me, but it also helped me to try to help others because I got that, right? Because I understand that when you come in, you're a bit defensive. At a, it, it creates sort of a defensive environment at a certain point, right? Mm -hmm. Because you know that people don't expect you to be as smart as you are. People don't expect you to have the level of ambition that you have. And so for me, recognizing that, and I said it today, that my ambition was sometimes misinterpreted as overconfident or arrogant Arrogance. or whatever, but it was really around what I knew I could do. And so I think there is sort of a defensive posture that you take because you're always trying to prove what you can do and how you can do it and prove that you're just as good or maybe you're even better. But once you get to a certain point, it's like, you know what? You don't really need to do that anymore. Now we need to work on how you succeed in this culture and in this environment. So that's, that's really what I mean by that. Who told you that? One was, actually, the first one was a vice president, and we were in a meeting. Male or female? Male, white male. And we were in a meeting, and I'll, I'll never forget it because it's one of my learnings, and there was a guy that was presenting something, and it was wrong. And I sat there and I said, you know, I'm sorry, but that's not right. And so he starts to be kind of kind of go back and forth. And after the meeting, the vice president said to me, he said, you know, sorry, Talisa, Talisa an error in mathematics, an yes. error in judgment, an, an error, error in integrity, an error in mathematics, okay. and the economics they, that they did was wrong. OK, so he said to me, he said, you know what, Talisa, you are exactly right. But at the end of the day, it wasn't going to drive the decision one way or the other. So he said, what I want you to think about is what was behind that posture of wanting to be right, mm -hmm. as opposed to what are we trying to accomplish in this meeting? So I, I would say that's one of the first learnings around, okay, you don't have anything to prove. And what are you really trying to accomplish in whatever setting you're in? And how do you want to show up? Do you think that your response there and what you felt like you needed to prove was any different from a newly minted MBA, white or black or man or female, that's trying to sort of prove their intelligence level in that same setting? I, I don't, but I think it was received differently because Tell I was a black female. Really? Yeah, I do. I think it was received mm -hmm. differently. So for me, it was more around, okay, let's think about what's important. What's going to move the needle? What is worth bringing up? Because knowing that it didn't move the needle today, I would probably wait until the meeting is over and say, look, I understand what you did. But your calculations. But your calculations, need, mm -hmm. you need to go look at those calculations. So that mm -hmm. was right. a learning. That was a learning that for me. Learning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. That was a good one. That's yeah. a great one. The concern that women, as they come up through their career, may or may not get the pressured feedback that is appropriate for development that people might hold back? It's not just women. We, in looking at where should we be going from here based on our book, one of the studies we saw was that black women get less support from their management than any other, almost any other class. So it's not just women, it's can black women get the kind of feedback they need to be successful, the kind of honest feedback they need. And right now, the results are not very good. What should it look like? One, be honest yeah. with me. Mm -hmm. Because what seems to be happening is that they're not getting the honest feedback, one. Two, establish a relationship with me. Black women tend to think that they are closer to their managers or executives than the executives think they are. Say, so that, say that again, Carolyn. We think we're closer to our executive than our executive thinks we're close to them. Interesting. So there's a gap in perception 
And part of it, I think, is, is an honesty issue. We think our relationship is a good relationship, that it's an honest relationship, it's an open relationship, when in fact, it's not. Is that driven by our misconception or the, what, what is that? I, I actually think it's driven by a couple of things, mm -hmm. one of which is that we have ownership in it. Mm -hmm. We must develop relationships as well as they must, must develop yes. relationships. It may be um, having dinner with our boss or some of the management team. That's something that we normally don't do. We who, keep who our asks? relationships who asks? separately. Who asks? Both can ask. Yes. If, if, if it's going we don't to ask, lunch, we need to. It's going to lunch. And that's, it's that's having a, that real strategic, sustainable relationship. That's a very good point because one of the things I said in my book, in my chapter, was that in seeing change, one of the male executives came by to invite me to lunch because he said, we're always going, we never invite you. Yes. And I guess if I were to do the flip side of that, did I ever approach them? Did you? No, I didn't because I was not feeling that I should. I mean, it was this old boys network where they're together and they're going off and I see them going, they know I'm here and they aren't asking me, <laughs> should I ask them, should I deal with rejection? What if they don't want to? I mean, well, or what? how do I feel about that? I'm pretty but, old school in the way I think about the boss subordinate relationship. As a subordinate, I'm not gonna ask my boss to go out with me. So I think sometimes we expect our companies and our corporations to be far ahead of where our communities are at large. Oh, okay, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right. Or just advanced in general right. of, of so everything. Yeah. at the end of the day, we kind of are where we are and it is about not making assumptions about people and what you think they think and what their background is. And that has to work both ways, yeah. right? And so, yeah. If I walk in the room and somebody already thinks they know exactly who I am and what I'm thinking, or if they walk in the room and I make certain assumptions about who they are and what they're thinking, it's gonna be very hard to develop the kind of relationship that you need, I think, to build trust. And so for me, it is about, I'm not somebody that's gonna go and just share my heart or my personal business with people, but I do want people to understand Here's my background. Here's what made me who I am. I'd like to understand that about you. And I think to your point, let's find that common ground and those commonalities because there are typically more commonalities than there are differences. And so to me, it's, it really is about, you know, not setting these grandiose expectations that, okay, I'm going to walk into this corporate world and it's going to be so much better than the world at large or the United States at large, or my neighborhood at large, right? It when kind it's of- it's just the microcosm right, of kind the of greater- is, Yeah, it kind of is what it is. Yeah. And so how do yeah. I, in this structured environment that has its own culture, and even in companies, every business line has its own culture, how do I go in and build enough of a relationship to be effective? And that's kind of the way I think that's about it, you know. Okay. Talisa, going back to what you said, it's almost human nature that before I approach you, I'm going to be thinking about, well, how's she going to take this and what's she going to think and how do I do this? And I think that's where we might lessen the feedback that we actually give. What do you do? How do you give the feedback? If we're talking to people out there and we're telling them how to invite your colleague to lunch, how to give this colleague feedback. For me, I want to know who that person is first. And how do you do that? I think being very deliberate about asking someone about themselves and what's important to them and how they make decisions. But I think caring enough to actually find out what that person is really a about and respecting that is important. And mm -hmm. I, but I think you have to do it sooner rather mm -hmm. than later. Exactly. Because you know times are different now, right? And you can make a mistake a lot quicker now and it's harder to recover. That concludes part four. 
Let's take a break and come back with our fifth and final part of the program and closing comments from the authors after this. We're back with the fifth and final part of the program and closing comments from the authors. Let me come around to everybody just for closing comments. What you want to leave the audience with about the energy within us, the book you just all co-authored and your lives depicted in that. So I guess just for me, I always tell my colleagues to kind of live their values, right? Make sure that you live your values, understand what they are. And then I want other people to understand that what we want is no different than others in terms of we want to be able to provide for our families. We same thing. We want to be able to be successful. We have varying levels of ambition and that there's so much capability that's untapped because of the inherent biases that are out there. And if we were to untap that talent and capability, how much more successful we would be. And so we're here to try to untap some of that and to try to support others to see what they bring to the table. And not necessarily to convince anyone, but just to get our own mentees to see they've got what they need to succeed. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I wanted to do with the book was to say, this is possible. It's possible. And you can probably go further than I did. And that's kind of why I'm participating in this, other than Hilda. Uh, <laughs> no, <just kidding. laughs> I owe them. Uh, big time. I agree with a lot you said, everything you said. The only thing that I would add to that is the message to people where you start out is not the end game. Mm -hmm. You might start out at one point, but you can definitely become, you can grow, you can be somebody, you can make a difference. You're not defined by your humble beginnings. I guess for me, it's there isn't any one path. You can take your path and go wherever it is you want to go. You don't have to follow somebody else's. And if there's any message in this book, it's we all got to this place, but we got there through very different pathways. Mm -hmm. And you can too. We hope you enjoyed this episode with the authors of the autobiographical book, The Energy Within Us. Special thanks to my generous, hospitable, and warm guests and hosts, authors, Talisa Tolliver, Carolyn Green, Joyce Hayes-Giles, and Hilda Penix ragland I'd like to express our special thanks to the clients of Lyceum Leadership Consulting that enable us to bring you this podcast. We'll be back very soon with our next episode, episode 27. Episode 27 will be directed at board members of regulated companies who are not from regulated company backgrounds. Join me and my guest, Dr. Mark Jamison, the director and Gerald Gunter Professor of the Public Utility Research Center at the University of Florida's Warrington School of Business. Dr. Jamison will provide a primer on the regulatory construct, including its history, reason for being, and advice around regulatory affairs and associated risk management from a board member's point of view. I hope you'll join me for our next episode. Until then, it's goodbye for now. We cannot improve without your feedback and suggestions. Please take a moment and an Apple podcast, Spotify, or on your favorite podcast platform. Follow us and rate us with your feedback. Leadership Lyceum, a CEO's virtual mentor, has been a production of the Leadership Lyceum LLC, copyright 2023, all rights reserved.